Did you ever wonder why the caduceus symbol is linked with modern medicine? What if I asked you which one of these two symbols, the caduceus and the rod of Asclepius, actually represents healing? In today's video, I am more than excited to share with you some insights on these symbols, what they mean, what they have in common, and what sets them apart. This symbol has been recommended to me a while back by one of my dear community members, so Luna, if you are watching, thank you for the suggestion. My promise to you today, not only another episode to get your metaphysical juices flowing, but also, if you watch until the end, I will share with you what snakes, healing, mercury, and the Full Metal Alchemist Anim series have in common. Ready to embark on this journey? Let's dive right in. Both rooted in Greek mythology and usually used interchangeably, the Rod of Asclepius and the Caduceus definitely do not tell the same story. So before I tell you more about each symbol, I want to share with you how these symbols are used nowadays. They're usually used in the medical field. The Caduceus and the Rod of Asclepius can be seen in hospitals, in health centers, as well as medicine-related academia and universities. So if you want to know the difference between the two symbols visually, the caduceus is a symbol with a short staff entwined by two serpents. Sometimes these serpents are surmounted by wings, they have wings. And the rod of Asclepius, on the other hand, is a symbol of a staff with a single snake on it. Let's start with the caduceus though. In Greek mythology, this symbol is the staff carried by Hermes, also known as Hermes Trismegistus in Greco-Egyptian mythology. And in Roman iconography, the caduceus was often depicted as being carried in the left hand of Mercury, aka Hermes. Uh, this is the hand of reception and openness, by the way. This is why it's the left hand and not the right hand, which is more the hand of giving, of active power. And Mercury, or Hermes, has many gifts that, you know, things that he rules over, if you want. Commerce, negotiation, eloquence, travel alchemy, printing, and even, you know, deft, thievery. You no, know, he's, he's the king of thieves. <laughs> so he's kind of like the jack of all trades, master of none type of thing. And Mercury is the messenger of the gods. And in Greek mythology, heralds or messengers are usually carrying a staff with them in order for them to know in which way they are headed, in order to, you know, remove blockages from their way, etc. So the Greek word Kerikon, Kerikon, I hope I'm pronouncing it right, um, from which the word caduceus is derived, literally means herald staff, herald meaning messenger. Astrologically speaking, Mercury represents perception, communication, receptivity, as well as the intellect. This is the mental realm and its power. And Mercury, as one of the fastest moving planets, is always in communication with the sun, and in astrology, the sun represents the core of our identity. And the reason why Mercury cannot move um, far away from the sun is because this planet, astronomically, cannot go further away than 29 degrees from the sun. So for the ancients, this meant that Mercury has always been portrayed as a messenger because he's always moving back and forth from the sun, to, you know, 20 degrees, 29 degrees apart, and then coming back to the core of our identity to give us these important messages. That's why in astrology, Mercury um, is our intellect, and our intellect usually has a big role to play in the forming of our identity, of our self, of our inner selves. And if you're curious to learn more about Mercury astrologically, make sure to check out the Occult Symbols podcast episode, where I share what astrological planetary glyphs represent esoterically, and I highly recommend you go watch that. Um, I, I loved making that video, it's very, very interesting, so make sure to check it out, I'll put the link in the description box. So let's do a symbol breakdown for the Caduceus. The divine symbol of the Caduceus at its core represents two snakes entwining a staff. This represents the Kundalini energy, so the divine feminine and the divine masculine intertwined. And the staff represents the spine. This is the life force, the vessel through which energy rises. 
and the wings that are sometimes added to the symbol express how this energy can expand and literally fly us into higher realms of being, if it is activated, of course. So learning the symbolism of the snakes is important here if you want to understand what this symbol means, because they do not just represent the divine feminine and divine masculine, they also stand for other things as well. So the snake, for ancient Mesopotamians and Egyptians alike, represented eternal life. Mentioned in most tales from around the world, from the snake encircling the world to the snake in the Garden of Eden, we can safely assume that the snake symbol is a universal one. Throughout history, the snake has been attributed to the best and to the worst of human um, nature. This is related to power, healing, immortality, knowledge, health, as well as poison, death, destruction, treachery, and even jealousy. And it is true, the snake is our ego. This is the inner Satan within each of us. The part of us that wants to become God, that cannot stand to humble itself down. This is the pure ego. This part is what makes us human, what makes life worth living. But at the same time, it is our vices, our demons, and our self-corruption. Carl Jung describes the serpent as the unconscious as the instinctive psyche, devouring the consciousness and threatening the order of things. And in this stance, we can look at the story of the serpent in the Garden of Eden and Satan as um, a metor you know, an, an allegorical uh, representation of this process of how our unconscious and our instinctive primitive psyche can sometimes eat us up and eat us alive. So the serpent, in this sense, heals and corrupts at the same time. Upwards or downwards, the serpent can either coil up or down. So there's two stories I'd like to share from religion and mythology to cast some light on the serpent symbolism even further. The first is the story of Moses, when he used a staff in front of the Pharaoh. In the Quran, it is said that right after his enlightenment, which, by the way, happened in a mountain by a tree, aka the tree of life, you'll see how this is a recurring theme in today's video, he is sent to the pharaoh and his mages, so his magicians, his astrologers, all of, you know, his magician um, buddies who have been practicing magic. He throws his rod in front of them and it turns into a snake. And this miracle made the magicians fall in awe in front of Moses, who never witnessed such power before. Even in front of the death threats of the humiliated Pharaoh, they still chose to proclaim the Almighty God as, you know, uh, the universal God. They renounced their, their previous fates and believed Moses because they saw this miracle of Moses turning a rod into a snake and holding it in his hand. And I'm, I'm sure this wasn't just visual, this had a lot of symbolic and um, potent meaning. You know, this wasn't just a visual thing. It's all about the meaning of what this act represents. And as a child, I was always fascinated by this one story. I didn't know back then that the scriptures are not historical texts, but much deeper insights and teachings. So through this story, we can see that the Caduceus energy at play is playing out here at its finest. It's a miracle. The message of the prophet, as well as the negotiation between the two sides, so the non-believers and the believers, is a miracle. So this serpent uh, in Moses' story is not to be confused with the Jewish Nehushtan, another serpent that described in the book of Numbers, where Yahweh, or God, instructed Moses to erect it so that the Israelites who saw it would be cured and protected from dying from the bites of fiery serpents, as they describe them, which Yahweh had sent to punish them for speaking against him and Moses. Numbers 21 says, The Lord said to Moses, Make a snake and put it up on the pole. Anything who is bitten can look at it and live. So Moses made a bronze snake and put it up on a pole. Then when anyone was bitten by a snake and looked at the bronze snake, he lived. So we can see a lot of, you know, similarities between these two symbols, but they're not quite the same. But we can feel this idea of um, the Caduceus. So the twin snakes on the Caduceus also come from the story of Tiresias in Greek mythology, who is a blind Theban seer and the son of one of Athena's favorites and the nymph Shariklo. So the story goes that 
um, Tiresias found two snakes copulating and making, you know, having sex. So he separated them with his magical staff. When he did this, he was turned into a woman, remaining that way until he was able to repeat the task seven years later, you know, to separate the two snakes who were copulating once again. So this staff, complete with the two serpents, was then passed on to Hermes. So keep this in mind, folks. Having lived as a man and as a woman is one of the themes of today's video. And when Tiresias returned to the site of the transformation seven years later to see if the spell could be reversed, Tiresias did indeed see the same snakes coupling and was changed back into a man. As you can imagine, this isn't to be understood in a uh, linear fashion. So uh, let me know, of course, in the comments if you've guessed what this implies as a spiritual teaching. But I'll share with you my thoughts uh, by the end of the video, so hold on tight to your seats. And the number seven here is very uh, important, so keep that in mind as well. So let's circle back here for a moment. The Caduceus symbol dates back to Mesopotamia. Well, like most things, actually. Um, but yeah, it dates back to Mesopotamia, where the Sumerian god called Ningshisida, I hope I'm pronouncing it right, but anyway, Ningishsida had a symbol who um, was a staff with two snakes intertwined around it, <laughs> as you can guess. So Ning Ningjishida, I'm gonna call him Nin, okay? So Nin was one of the underworld gods of Sumer and a patron of medicine and fertility. He was called the Lord of the Good Tree and he was commonly associated with snakes, trees, and vegetation. And the funny thing here is that Nin in Ningishida, or Ningshida, however <laughs> it's pronounced, uh, can be translated to lady in some context. So it was grammatically neutral in Sumerian and it can be found in the names of many deities, both male and female. So in the male counterpart, we have Ningikshida, Ning we have Ninazu, we have Ninurta, etc. And for the female deities, we have Ninlil, Ninkasi, etc. etc. So this means that Ningikshida Ning was a gender neutral god some sort of queer identity if you'd like. And guess who's also gender fluid in astrology? Mercury, the same god he came to be associated with thousands of years later. So this dates back to 4000 BC. And what this tells us is that the ancient teachings and mysteries found in this symbol are as old as our humanity and they are universal. They have been known to different cultures and civilizations all around the world, even if they didn't communicate with each other back then. And it is our duty to dig up through time in order to understand what our predecessors have tried to convey with these symbols that all look alike. So fast forward to the 7th century, the symbol became came to be associated with alchemy. At this time, alchemists were referred to as the sons of Hermes. Hermetic astrological principle based on the virtues of the planet and Hermes Trismegistus as an initiated teacher began to spread among those who were interested in metaphysics and gnosis, aka knowledge. Now that we've learned what the caduceus and the snake and the tree and the queer stuff all represent, let's take a look at the rod of Asclepios. So Asclepios is an ancient Greek physician who eventually was deified as the god of medicine. He was usually portrayed as a bearded man wearing a robe, a long robe, that leaves his chest uncovered and holding a staff with his sacred single serpent coiled around it. Asclepios was a skilled physician who practiced in Greece around 1200 BC and he was described in Homer's Iliad, by the way, and eventually through myth and legend and time he came to be worshipped as Asclepios, the Greek god of healing. For the records, Asclepios was the son of Apollo and the nymph Coronis, and in mythology, Coronis took a mortal lover while she was pregnant with Asclepios, and when Apollo heard of this adultery, he sent Artemis, another deity, to kill Coronis. As she was dying, Apollo felt pity for his unborn child, who was still in her womb, of course, so he rescued Asclepios. And Asclepios was then sent to be raised by Chiron, a wise centaur that taught him healing and medicine. And Chiron, or the wounded healer, is a very important astrological centaur or asteroid. I may dedicate a more astrology-themed video 
on uh, Chiron soon, so let me know in the comments down below if that would interest you. But anyways, Asclepios became such a skilled healer that he was able to raise mortal patients back from the dead. And Zeus killed him later on with a thunderbolt because he was afraid immortality may become mainstream. Another theory about the natural origin of this symbol uh, and its relation with healing is that in ancient Greece, infections by the Draconculus medicensis worm, I know, I know, such a weird name, but <laughs> bear with me here. So the Draconculus medicensis worm, which is a very severe worm you don't want to have around your body, uh, these infections were very common and they were also known as the Guinea worm disease. So this worm entered the body and traveled just beneath the skin, disgusting, I know, and healers like Asclepios treated this condition by making a small cut in the person's skin just ahead of the worm's path, and as the worm crawled out, it was wrapped around a small stick, you know, a small stick or a baton, something like a, that looks like a, you know, chopstick or something. And this resulted in the image of having a single snake wrapped around a stick, known as the Rod of Asclepios. So Asclepios had several daughters in mythology, including Hygieia, the goddess from which we get the word hygiene. He also had another uh, daughter called Lasso, so the goddess of recu recuperation from illness. Uh, another daughter of his is Asiso, goddess of the healing process. Uh, Aglia, the goddess of healthy glow, beauty, and adornment, and Panakia, Panacea, the goddess of universal remedies. So Hippocrates, one of the most outstanding figures of science in our modern and ancient world, as well as the father of medicine, was a worshipper of Asclepios. So the Hippocratic oath, <laughs> doctors and physicians and, you know, um, health workers all around the world take in order to practice and the primum non nocere are all originally inspired by the teachings and wisdom of gods, such as Apollo and his son Asclepius and his daughters. So I'm going to put here just the first sentences of um, the Hippocratic Oath, because originally this is what it says. It says, I swear by Apollo, healer, by Asclepius, by Hygieia, by Panakia, and by all the gods and goddesses, making them my witnesses, that I will carry out, according to my ability and judgment, this oath and this indenture. Of course, nowadays, with modern times and people who are atheists and <laughs> who are definitely not spiritual at all about their... Um, um, their practice, their medical practice, the oath changed and it's adapted, of course, to also different religions. In Morocco, as an example, you swear by God, by Allah. You don't swear by these uh, polytheistic gods and goddesses. Before we wrap this video up, I want to quickly answer a question that I received in regards to the full metal alchemist symbol. It's called the Flamu, and the symbol is not the Caduceus or the Rod of Asclepius, According to the Anime Show, it is said to be a symbol taken from the work of Nicolas Flamel, who is a French alchemist. And by the way, funny um, anecdote, I work uh, in my 9 to 5, outside of my astrology uh, business, I work uh, in an office near uh, one of the streets where Nicolas Flamel lived. Uh, this is in Paris, of course, so let me know if you'd ever love me to do a vlog type of experience going there and just looking at the place. It is a very cute, uh, narrow street and uh, building. I think there is a restaurant and hotel there right now. But yeah, it's very, very cute place. But anyways, this symbol in the show represents the alchemical process of fixing the volatile. As interested as I am in alchemy, I still don't have all the secrets to this amazingly inspiring world. So if any alchemist or alchemy enthusiast out there is willing to share, please help me understand what fixing the volatile represents. So in a nutshell, the Caduceus and the Rod of Asclepius, what do they represent? They represent our ability to mix our divine feminine, our divine masculine, our death and our life together, to blend them together and to use these opposing forces to heal and to regenerate. And one of the stories that I shared with you earlier Tiresias, um, who actually was turned into a woman for seven years, returned after seven years and was transformed back 
This number seven was very symbolic because seven is the year of spiritual completion. It's also the year that our human body cells need to regenerate fully. So each seven years, you're technically not the same person you were back in the days. So the Caduceus and the Rod of Asclepius can truly help us transform and change and grow into a different person. And if you want to be exact, the Rod of Asclepius is, you know, the Rod of Medicine and Healing. And the Caduceus is not technically the Rod of Healing. It is more about changing and transmuting energies. And that's it for today, guys. Thank you so much for listening until the end. I am so grateful to have this platform where I can discuss my favorite things with y'all. So tell me, what symbol would you like me to review next? Let me know in the comments. I'll catch you next time. And if you liked today's video, make sure to watch this one. I'm sure you'll enjoy it.